Okay, good morning everybody. We'll start the last lecture of the Chandrasekhar series by one. Okay, so um, today I'll be talking about uh, some way of making eternally traversable wormholes. Uh, and the talk really will have two parts. Uh, one part will be about these wormholes in two-dimensional gravity and also the SYK model. And the second part will be related to how to do that in uh, four dimensions. Uh, so the two are basically two aspects of the same thing, are very similar, but I'll discuss it in an apparently different way. Uh, so the first, paper, the, the first part is based on a paper that we wrote with Xiaolan Chi that's already appeared in the archive. Um, okay, so this part is about trying to understand global ADS2. What do I mean by that? So we have ADS2 space-time, is a space-time that, well, is two-dimensional. Uh, it has a global time, T, which uh, runs along this vertical direction in the Penrose diagram. And then the coordinate sigma is a space-like uh, coordinate, which um, takes a finite range from zero to pi in these coordinates. Um, and that's, uh, so it's a, basically a, a strip. It's, the Penrose diagram is conformal to this strip, uh, but of course we have this work factor. Now, this space has SL2R isometries. It has uh, two boundaries. The two boundaries are causally connected, so we can send the signal from one boundary to another. Um, and then if you have a particle that propagates in this space-time, uh, this uh, warp factor acts as a gravitational potential that confines the particle in the central region, so the particle will start oscillating. And so that implies that if you look at the spectrum of uh, particles in this space-time, you will find the gap spectrum, so a spectrum with a, with a gap, and uh, with discrete energy levels. Um, okay, so that's uh, global ADS2 coordinates. Um, and you can view this as uh, uh, a kind of traversable wormhole. So you have these two boundaries, and they're causally connected. You can go between the two. Um, now, a, a lot of the discussion of, let's say, SYK and uh, thermal, um, thermal ADS that we discussed last time um, was um, looking at the same uh, space-time, same ADS2, but in different coordinates. So these are uh, the so-called thermal or Rindler coordinates, and they cover only a little portion, this uh, triangle here to the right, uh, of the full Penrose diagram of ADS. Um, now, if you look at, the, at this, and you can consider this side, and then this other side could be like the thermophil double of the first side, uh, then uh, you find that in this case, they are causally disconnected. So if, the time, if you only restrict to regions here with time goes from plus to minus infinity, uh, you cover a finite uh, range of global times, and then you cannot, within this finite range, you cannot send the signal to the other side. Okay. Um, now, the previous, uh, both of these metrics, so this one and the previous one, uh, make manifest one uh, isometry of, AD, of ADS2, one of the SL2 isometries. One, is, one was the, but the two are two different elements, so T and capital T, which was the one in the previous transparency, and this small t, which is the one uh, corresponding to Rindler time, uh, are two different elements of SL2. Yes? I couldn't hear. With the value of beta here, you said it's, this is like a thermophile double state, so beta. beta yeah. So in, the, in these coordinates, this beta uh, is 2 pi, right, uh, with these coordinates, but the physical value is determined by the location of the boundary. Re remember that uh, yesterday we Make a, made a big deal about the location, the actual physical location of the boundary, and that determines the proper time along that curve, okay. uh, and the relationship between that and this time will determine the physical value of beta. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, embe uh, this ADS2 embedded in uh, Minkowski 3, uh, two, Minkowski 2 plus 1, uh, then these two isometries, uh, do they uh, correspond to uh, translations uh, along the two time directions? Well, if, you, if you embed it in a higher dimensional space, you cannot preserve all three isometries. So mm. you have to break some of the isometries. Uh, no, I mean, I was uh, talking about the interpretation. Uh, how do you interpret this isometry? S save, your, save your question to the, to the last part of the talk. We'll discuss this in detail. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have... Um, Okay, so we know that if we have exactly ADS2, we, it really does not make sense. Quantum gravity in exactly ADS2 is not really well defined, so we need to break some of the ADS2 isometries slightly. And we discussed yesterday that if we take ADS2 with this uh, Rindler time isometry and we break, uh, we, we break the other isometries, so that we keep this one, 
Uh, then that has interpretation of a quantum mechanical system at finite temperature. Okay? And so that's the thermal field level of a nearly CFT1 uh, quantum, quantum mechanical system. So now we can ask um, about nearly ADS2. So by nearly ADS2, I mean an ADS2 where the dilaton is varying. So we have something like Jakub Teitelbaum theory, and the dilaton is varying, and the coupling is growing towards bo both, both boundaries. So when we have that situation with the T isometry, the question is what it is. And so the rest of the talk will be tried to answer, in, to answer this question. Um, so let's first recall some facts about nearly ADS2 boundary conditions. Um, so this is uh, what I was saying yesterday, that it's uh, described by this simple action. Um, and this comes from a higher dimensional space where uh, we have, might have some flat space, but we are focusing on this nearly ADS2 region. So a region where the metric is close to ADS2. So we are putting some cutoffs roughly here, and we are focusing on what's below. Um, now, when we have this situation uh, in what we discussed yesterday, we can think of the gravitational dynamics of this problem as uh, particles moving in ADS2 plus the motion of two boundary particles, right? And we had this discussion of the full Hilbert space. Um, now, in, with pure gravity, the only solution is uh, a solution that uh, for phi, that where phi grows towards both boundaries. So the only solution like that is the one that has the T isometry. So the, the real time isometry. And, um, so in order to uh, have uh, this other solution that we're looking for, it cannot be a vacuum solution. Uh, it has to have some kind of matter, some kind of extra stress tensor source. Uh, but you cannot do it with ordinary matter, because if you have ordinary matter, it will obey the uh, null energy condition, it would say. So, so the one we want is one in which uh, phi is growing in both directions. Uh, but if phi is growing in both directions, then this uh, particular derivative, um, uh, it, OK. So this relationship here, this equality is implied by Einstein's equations. And then from the requirement that phi grows in both directions, you find that the left-hand side is, uh, is negative. And that implies that, that this integral of the stress tensor should be negative. Um, so this was the original Einstein equation. It's a version of the right shell degree equation. Um, and, uh, and so we need uh, some weird kind of matter. So ordinary matter here in the, in the interior will obey the positive uh, null energy condition. If we have uh, directly under condition, let's say, on the strip, if that would be true. So we have to do something more. I didn't yes. And uh, why you said the only solution with phi growing towards both boundaries, uh, the, how did it follow? Uh, yeah. So um, yesterday, for, for example, in Mandel's talk, we saw that the, the solutions for phi are characterized by just a few parameters, right? And once you, um, it turns out that the only solution for just pure gravity without matter, without uh, with zero stress tensor, um, is one where um, where phi has the isometries given by this time translation. That's the only solution. Uh, yeah, that's the only solution. So the, the, it's related to the fact that this theory has no propagating degrees of freedom. So, the, so you don't have an infinite family of solutions. You have just a family with a, a small number of numbers. And you can, uh, the only solution will have a, an isometry which will correspond to this. Uh, the, the other constants that were appearing correspond to shifting the location of this uh, center, but as we said, that doesn't mean anything. And then shifting the overall temperature. Uh, so that's, uh, so we need one where we have, uh, mat we have matter, and in addition, we are setting up uh, the boundary conditions in such a way that the matter has negative null energy. Um, so the interesting thing is that we can do that. And so this is uh, the same idea as in the uh, Gauge, Jefferies, and Wall paper. Um, so the idea is to uh, add an interaction um, that, or a boundary, put a boundary condition for the bulk fields that mix the left and the right. So somehow the bulk fields are connected across the two boundaries. Um, and if you do that, then this will generate a null energy condition and will allow uh, for a solution with global time isometry where phi grows towards both boundaries. So we can uh, analyze this. And in parallel, we look, we look at a similar problem in the SYK model. So uh, as you know, well, this is uh, the same transparency I showed yesterday. So we are going to deal with this model. And uh, we are going to deal with two copies of the model. So we'll have two identical copies with identical couplings. 
uh, and uh, we're going to put an interaction between them. So Psi left are the fermions in the left copy, and Psi right are the fermions in the right copy. Okay, so the, uh, there shouldn't be an integral here. I mean, this looks like a Lagrangian, but um, it should be mu times uh, Psi left, Psi right. right? Uh, the, the integral is a typo. Mm. Um, and then, so we can take this, and it turns out that the low energies, as we explained, uh, we can concentrate, so the, there are, the, this theory will be described by some sector, which uh, will be conformal invariant, that will, can be interpreted as particles moving through the bulk, and then a piece that has to do with gravity. And the piece that has to do with gravity, that is similar to, to gravity, is related to this low action mode, which is the, uh, there is one, reparameterization uh, for the left, left uh, SYK model and one for the right SYK model. And, um, and then um, there is some, uh, the, yeah, so what we're doing is we are, um, yeah, maybe I, I will explain it in the next transparency a little better and then we'll go back to the previous transparency. So um, if we think about uh, the, these two copies of the SYK model, we can think of, um, of it in terms of um, this uh, function g, which is a function of two times, right? Uh, which is what was appearing in the effective action, right? Now, the space of in the space of all of of all the g's, there is some solution uh, that corresponds to the thermophile double, right? So imagine you have two two non-interacting copies of SYK. Uh, that system has one particular solution, which is the thermophile double at some temperature, right? Um, and that's one solution in the space of all Gs. Now, in that space, uh, if you look at the action, so the action has an actual minimum here, right, uh, where we have that solution once we fix the temperature. But in addition, it has a low, energy, low action valley, right, which corresponds to changes of G along reparametrizations, right, which is when we change G by doing a reparametrization of the infrared solution. Okay. So that's uh, this whole uh, low action valley. Uh, and now we are adding the interaction between the two sides. So we are going to add the interaction with a small coefficient. Um, and so the interaction will give us some potential, some extra potential in uh, some extra action, let's say, in this whole space. Okay. Um, but the idea is that um, because the coefficient will be small, uh, we'll only focus on the potential along the valley, right? So there is a small potential. And to first approximation, we can ignore the directions uh, orthogonal to the valley and just focus on reducing that uh, interaction potential along the valley directions, right? And that corresponds to taking this uh, interaction and, um, well, which is simply this term in the action, so it's linear, it's a linear term in the G. Um, and not evaluated for all possible Gs, but only evaluated along the valley. So evaluating it along the valley just gives us uh, this combination. Um, so this is the same as uh, uh, this expression, except that here we choose the T is um, that global time coordinate. So we can, when we think about these reparametrizations, we can express the time in terms of um, the global time or the Poincaré time and so on. So this is the punk F is the Poincaré time, and then here T is, uh, is more similar to the global time. Um, yes. Or each right, but this is a mixed term. Um, yes, so um, originally when we, last, last lecture it was defined in terms of one copy, um, and we're mostly doing Euclidean time. Uh, but when we uh, take that, that one copy in Euclidean time and we continue to Lorentzian signature, we, it continues to the thermophile double, which really has two copies. And so we can think of the G as, uh, in, in terms of these two copies. So the initial solution is the thermophile double for two separate non-interacting um, SYK models, and now we're doing a deformation of that. So the deformation is this extra yeah, interaction. Be like a halfway, halfway analytic continue, periodic analytic continuation of one of the sides, right? Yes, yes. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's what we are doing. And so we are going to now find the solution somehow along this valley. So there will be, along the valley, there will be a new potential, and the solution will not be this, but it will be displaced uh, in some way. So, and the displacement will consist in just uh, finding a reparametrization of the original solution. Or, or in other words, uh, 
we, we were discussing, and, and that's, that's, the, that's the physical meaning of, uh, or, or let's say the conceptual meaning of this action that we are writing here. So we're making an approximation by, this, by uh, think, thinking purely only about the, this mode F, so this, this gravitational mode or reparameterization mode, um, and treating the interaction, the approximation we just mentioned, then we find the solution of this action. Um, as, as before, this action has a S global SL2R symmetry that we think of it as a gauge symmetry. So we set the total SL2R charge to zero, and that uh, also is important for determining the solution. Um, and you can think of this reparameterization in different ways, but one way to think about it is as uh, specifying a trajectory, the trajectory of the boundary, right, in, uh, in the total space. And before, the boundary trajectories were hitting the boundary of ADS2. Now, uh, there will be, once you put in this term, uh, there are solutions where the boundaries just uh, go basically straight up, uh, or they might have small oscillations and so on. But there's in particular a solution where the boundaries just go straight up, they don't hit the boundaries of ADS. And then in this situation, uh, we uh, can say that, well, we have this traversable wormhole here in the middle, or at least from the gravity point of view, that's what we have. Uh, as we said, this, this dynamics is uh, equivalent to the dynamics of uh, gravity, and, and that's, uh, okay. Mm. So there is a solution, so you can take uh, this action, and then, uh, well, after doing this, this, this is the, the parametrization that goes from uh, Poincare time to this global time, and after you do that, then you find a solution, a simple solution where this global time is constant, so this means that things go away constant times uh, proper time, so that means they go just straight up. Um, and then, um, when you set to zero the cell to our charges, you find the relationship between um, that, uh, some condition that determines what this t, t prime is in terms of uh, j or some dimension full constant. Um, and this relationship essentially, uh, well, it depends on the dimension of the field uh, whose boundary value we are connecting, right? And in order, in order for so if mu over, over j is small, and we want a t prime that is smaller than j, so that we are within the approximations, uh, we need that delta should be, be between 0 and 1. Okay? So it, this only works when the field in the bulk has low enough dimension. Yes? So th there's a particular sign of mu that's being chosen, right? Because you, you, don't, you, don't, yes, you yes. want to bring the boundary yes, 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 and yes, not yes, yes, the yes, yes. So, yeah, if this, this only, so if you were to change here the sign of mu, then there wouldn't be a solution of this kind. The, the, the boundaries would follow basically the trajectory they had before. Um, uh, yeah, so the sign of mu, I mean, what, what um, this interaction, you can view this, uh, this, this fermion by line, this Majorana fermion by linear as forming a qubit, right? Forming a spin. What you want is an interaction such that the thermophile double is the spin down state, right? Um, so, so that that has the lowest energy. An interaction looks like a, you know, sigma C. Um, okay, so in, from the point of view of gravity, what you have is some negative energy here in the interior that, uh, and, um, and so on. So you can, you have the, the solution with, that solution that we described so far is the, the lowest, uh, lowest energy solution, but you can consider small perturbations. Uh, for example, you can have small oscillations around this minimum. And uh, this shows that the, this equilibrium uh, situation is stable equilibrium as opposed to unstable. Um, and uh, you can also add matter and have uh, a spectrum. Uh, well, there will be a whole discrete spectrum. And what's interesting is that this discrete, discrete spectrum is determined by conformal symmetry. So uh, naively, you had this SYK models that were almost conformal invariant, and you added the relevant deformation, which is this uh, mass term. And so for general systems, when you add a relevant deformation, the spectrum in the infrared is something complicated to find. Um, but uh, in this case, it's, it's determined uh, by the conformal properties of the original solution. Um, so in fact, this, uh, this construction is a bit like the um, line to, um, it's similar to the plane to cylinder mapping of higher dimensional CFTs, except that here we have a line uh, mapped to two lines somehow. That's the the line to the global ADS map, yeah. When you add the matter, does it feel the boundaries or not? It doesn't feel so metric. Yes, so, so if, if, you, if this, um, 
I mean, we're imagining a situation where mu is small. That means that these boundaries will be far, far away. Um, and so when you add matter, and if you don't excite the matter too much, to, to linear approximation, you can ignore the motion of the boundaries and the fact even that the boundary is there. Um, if you uh, start exciting the matter and making it go all the way to the boundary, then it matters that the boundary is there. And uh, well, you, you, you so it can reach it in finite. Yeah, it can. Yeah, of course, this matter time. can reach it in finite time. You can consider correlator correlation functions now between the two sides. And in the thermal field level, those correlation functions well were decaying in time. Now they will grow in time, and at some point they will become singular when you can send the signal from one to the other. Um, yeah. So that that will be a property both in SYK and in this model. So. Um, so it's interesting that the spectrum of this coupled model is determined by conformal symmetry, so conformal symmetry implies a concrete uh, uh, prediction for the spectrum. Um, yeah, this is the same as I was just saying, but with formulas. So this piece is the spectrum of the, the conformal spectrum, yeah. I mean, from the uh, SYK point of view, the yeah. uh, perturbation you added seemed perfectly fine, relevant yeah. perturbation. But how come in the interior that corresponds to matter, which is, I mean, is, is there's any uh, way to see why that should have led to some matter with negative? negative energy? No, I, I don't see why it should, uh, that, that should be the case. Um, well, um, yeah. Um, well, I mean, the, I can tell you why you get negative energy, but uh, in fact, uh, for example, if you had changed the sign of mu, you wouldn't get this negative energy, right? So it's not a priori that for any per any situation you'll have it. It's just for situations where you're perturbing by some quantity, which you are adding some term in the Hamiltonian that had already a web, right? That's why you, the, the new energy will be negative, and that might. So if you if you have things that are correlated and you add a term such that uh, when they are correlated the energy decreases, it's natural that the energy will be more negative than it was before. So that 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 is maybe some indirect way to say. It. Um, so there is part of the spectrum that comes from matter, which is conformal invariant, and then there is some part that comes from the motion of the two boundaries. And that piece will not uh, look conformal invariant. So that th there, there will be some breaking of the conformal symmetry. Um, uh, but there, the spectrum is completely gapped. And you to lead in order, it's very simple. It's just uh, completely explicitly given by the symmetries of the problem. Um, um, so it's a bit, th this is a bit like the Seaman effect in, for an atom, where you, have, uh, you put an atom in a magnetic field. And if the atom has some angular momentum, then you get a bunch of uh, energy levels. Uh, um, so here uh, it's similar. So this extra interaction term is like the magnetic field. And, um, now in, in SYK we can solve uh, the theory beyond the low energy limit. Um, and uh, so there you, well maybe I'll probably, maybe it's out of time, so maybe I won't discuss this in great detail. But um, so what I discussed was the solution of the problem uh, at the low energies using this uh, reparametrizations and so on. But in the SYK, you can also use it, solve it using the Schringer Dyson equations, and that will be valid for all energies. Um, and well, you can do that and find a bunch of functions, a bunch of equations. They look uh, weird, they're not so complicated. Um, but uh, then you can solve them. And perhaps one of the interesting, most interesting aspects of this solution is uh, that um, you can now take that uh, strip that we had before and we put it at finite temperature. And, you can, this is like taking global ADS and putting it at finite temperature. Normally you have a phase transition, and in this case you also have a phase transition. Um, but the interesting thing is that um, the different phases are actually continuously connected, so there is a solution that continuously connect, uh, connects the phases, and which suggests that in the microcanonical ensemble, uh, you have a continuous uh, motion between the two, the, the two transitions, which has that as you, um, um, so that's different than, uh, so well in ADS you have a feature more or less like this. Um, so there is, a, let me see if I have. So here the different phases correspond to, let's say the global ADS with time identified as this horizontal line. The, this line here corresponds to the same thing but with extra matter here in the center. Um, and this one corresponds to two disconnected, um, to two disconnected black holes. Um, 
Yeah. So the curves are for varying values of mu? Uh, no, the curves, we change the temperature. So if we, we fix mu, and then we change the temperature. And the, it, what's plotted here is the free energy as a function of temperature. So here there is a first order phase transition. Yeah, sorry, I went too fast. Um, so this is the free energy as a function of temperature, and there is a first order phase transition here. The, this, is, this, this line is a stable phase here and metastable here. And this uh, over the the upper line is an unstable phase. In the, it's unstable in the canonical ensemble. But the claim is for the the yeah this we haven't proven. But uh, the um, what we think is that it will be stable in the microcanonical ensemble. Uh, and and the negative energy point where the entropy goes to zero that that's coming from the Casimir energy after. Yeah. So here because this is horizontal, this will have very little entropy. Uh, this guy will have a high entropy because it uh, has a slope. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you can do this numerically and so on. Uh, now, you could also start with, the, uh, with this state, right, the coupled state, and at t equal to zero, you turn off the coupling. And if you do that, then you produce the thermophile double. So this is uh, one way in which you can produce the thermophile double. So it's, you produce a state which is close to the thermophile double. It's not quite identical, but it's uh, basically the same to lead in order in, in the mu over j expansion. Um, so you might have thought, oh, maybe the thermophile double is super difficult to make, but you can make states, uh, this state that is pretty close to it. So, uh, and, um, okay. Um, so the conclusion is that as a variant of the gauge aphorism and wall teleportation idea or traversable wormhole, uh, we can get uh, this e more eternally traversable wormhole. So in their paper, they had something which uh, was, let's say, traversable only for an instant. So here yeah. it's traversable for all times. And we get the picture for global ADS2. And you can analyze it in the SYK or in ADS2 gravity. And we discuss some thermal aspects. And we also realize a state that is close to the thermophile double uh, as the ground state of this coupled system. So um, it's just a practical way to get the state. Okay, so that ends the first part of the talk. Are there uh, some questions? Uh, yeah. Bring the boundaries together closer and closer. Yeah. Crank up mu. Yeah. Uh, from the SYK point of view, can you see what goes wrong when, when the boundaries almost try to go? Well, no, no, well uh, the, in the SYK, the, as, as mu becomes larger, this low energy approximation uh, will break down. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the, the idea that you can focus so, so we discussed the valley, right? The, yeah. Remember that picture of the valley? That picture is correct uh, when uh, we are at low energies. As we raise the energy, it's as if the, the walls of the valley open up, and uh, we cannot really talk about the valley. We have to talk about the full space. And, and you can. And by doing, solving it, the swinger dyson equations numerically, you can just analyze that case too. But does something special happen from the Swinger Dyson equation point of view when you when you no 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 so, so it goes continuously so, yeah. so basically the space time picture goes away but as you would expect yeah but but it's uh, it's continuously connected there is one one thing that happens uh, well maybe if you want something interesting that happens so if you look this is the phase transition and here is a function of mu right this is for very tiny mu is what we were describing uh, and then when mu gets large enough uh, you lose the phase phase transition so it's like the liquid water. But that's the only, it's a little detail, it's not important. Um, any other question? Uh, um, okay, so now we'll discuss um, how with the intuition that we got from this two-dimensional situation, we can create a wormhole in four dimensions. But don't worry, if you didn't understand what I said so far, I think this part should be understandable on its own, okay? It's just... Uh, historically, that was the motivation. And this is based on work in progress with two students, uh, Alexei Milekin and Fedor Popov. So you might have seen this uh, drawing by Wheeler. John Wheeler liked to draw this, uh, where uh, you, have, um, you, you have a kind of wormhole that uh, swallows, let's say, electric field lines or, let's say, magnetic field lines. And then they come out of, uh, this is a positive charge particle and this is a negative charge particle, right? And instead of having the charged particles, we have a little wormhole that connects the two. Okay. So the goal would be to uh, construct a solution that looks like this. Okay. Uh, the first point is that um, yeah, that the, the following that uh, well, maybe I'll um, 
Well, let me first let, let me first recall something. I, I don't remember if I already said this, but that there are no science fiction wormholes. Okay, um, and they are so science fiction wormhole is a wormhole that with a, where these two points are further in in the ambient space than the the distance through the wormhole. Okay, in principle, just from the geometric point of view, this, this can very well happen. Um, but such, such geometries do not obey Einstein's equations uh, with uh, the integrated null energy condition. Um, so if you assume that Einstein's equations hold and this chronal average energy condition holds, then they are forbidden. Okay? And this is uh, supposed to hold for the fastest line that exists in a space-time. So the, this is a conjecture. It hasn't been proven. It's been proven in flat space or some simple spaces. But it's conjecture that if you have the fastest line fastest null line in a space-time, uh, this integral should be positive. Um, now, this need not be the case when uh, the mouths of the wormhole are closer than the distance through the wormhole. So then this null line, this is my, you might have a null line that goes through the wormhole, and if the integrated null energy condition were to hold, then it would also be forbidden. And classical matter obeys the null energy condition, and so this is forbidden in classical physics. But in quantum physics, it's not forbidden if that's not the fastest line in your space-time. Uh, and if the distance between these two points is shorter than this distance, that's certainly not the fastest uh, null line. Okay? Um, and so these are possible if uh, you take into account quantum effects. So let's, uh, let, let's just recall why it is possible to have negative energy, or, what, or a situation where you can have negative energy. Imagine you have a two-dimensional field theory you have a circle, spatial circle, and then you have time, right? Then in this situation, uh, we have a Casimir energy, and that Casimir energy contributes to T++, and it gives that T++ is less than zero. Um, and so if we were to integrate along this null direction that goes around the cylinder, um, um, you would get some negative value, right? Um, Okay, and so that's, that, that uh, happens, and you can see very explicitly in, in any uh, field theory, in a conformal field theory in two dimensions, that that would be true. And it's a well-known fact that the energy, Casimir energy is negative. So the conclusion is that, well, the null energy condition does not have to hold for lines which are not the fastest lines. Uh, so for, this is not the fastest line in the sense that, for example, the, these two points that are along the null, the, the null line are time-like separated, right? So um, when you have the fastest line, there are no two points that are time-like separated. Those are called acronal lines, but anyway. Um, so in order to construct the solution, we'll need some elements. So we'll need something looking like a circle to, so that we have negative energy. Um, and we also will need a large number of bulk fields in order to make sure that we can balance classical effects against quantum effects uh, and so that the calculation is under control. So when you want to balance classical against quantum, you need uh, some good reason to, to be able to do this. So the classical effects have to be particularly small, and the quantum effects have to be particularly large, so that you can really balance the two. And so we'll assemble these elements in a few steps. Um, so the theory we're going to consider is the following. So we'll take a four-dimensional Einstein theory, uh, plus a U1 gauge field, plus a massless fermion that is charged under this U1 gauge field. Okay, so those are the necessary elements or well, sufficient, let's say, elements, maybe. And this could be, uh, this action could be described in the standard model at very short distances, where uh, at very short distances we can neglect the mass of the fermions, uh, and um, the, this uh, U1 gauge field could be the U1 of the standard model. Okay. Uh, but we, we don't have to do the standard model. Let's just uh, consider this theory. Um, for simplicity, we can consider here a Dirac fermion. Uh, so first, uh, we'll look at one solution. So the first solution will consist of uh, uh, extremal or near-extremal uh, magnetically charged black hole with magnetic charge Q. So Q is an integer in this talk, so it will be uh, just an integer. I'm going to set L Planck to 1, so the mass of the black hole is uh, equal to Q. Um, and um, there, there is, when we're at finite temperature, there is a small correction, so this term will be very small. Okay. Um, and in this situation, the geometry looks like flat space far away. As you approach uh, the object, uh, you have this long neck, which is the, has the geometry of ADS2 times S2, and eventually uh, you'll get to the horizon quite deep. And here, the length, so roughly speaking, the length of this is, the, is beta. Uh, more precisely, it's not really the proper length, but it's the 
redshift factor between the top and bottom, okay? That will be beta. Um, that turns out equal to be equal to beta. So now, so that's the basic solution. Now we'll see what happens to fermions uh, in, the, in this solution, to the charged fermions. So the point is that uh, we have this magnetic field that has a flux on the two-sphere. So we have fermions moving in a magnetic field. So we'll have uh, Landau levels. And uh, for massless fermions like this, there is a precisely zero energy uh, Landau level that comes from a cancellation between the orbital energy and the spin, the magnetic dipole uh, coupling to, to the magnetic field. Um, and um, so the, the generacy of that Landau level is equal to the flux of the magnetic field on the sphere, so it's equal to Q. So we'll have Q um, zero energy states. And um, so that, that, that's the energy, let's say, um, yeah, so we have zero energy. And then we'll get effectively massless fermions that propagate in the two other dimensions, so in time and the direction along the magnetic field. Okay, is that clear? So this should be clear. To it's not clear. We can try to repeat it. Okay. So um, now these Landau levels, you can think of them as uh, being localized on the sphere in a region where the, you have magnetic one unit of uh, magnetic flux, right? Uh, and then it's localized roughly within each region. So you can think of each Landau level, the, each uh, member of the, this Landau level, as being localized, in a little wave function localized on the sphere uh, along the uh, magnetic field lines. And they, they will be uh, following the magnetic field line. So here, um, um, so on this sphere, um, well, we have this state in green that is localized, and uh, it's following the magnetic field line. So we have like a two-dimensional Fermion, two dimensions are time and the direction along this green line, and it will be moving along this uh, sort of, it is as if you had a, a string, let's say, and the fermion moves along the string. There is no physical string, there is just a magnetic field line, it's just the fermion moving along this magnetic field line. Um, okay, so now uh, let me recall uh, some properties of ADS2. So we, we discussed these two Penrose diagrams of ADS2. Um, and uh, we decided that we can choose these different coordinates, so these global coordinates or these Poincaré coordinates. Um, and um, so starting from, uh, from these solutions, um, we can um, start with ADS2 times S2 in any of these coordinate systems, and then somehow connect them to the ambient space-time in various ways. So we are interested in preserving the time translation isometry and of, of the, the, the original four-dimensional space-time, and we can do it in various ways. So one is to um, patch, it, uh, patch it preserving this isometry, and then we'll have the near extremal black hole that we already discussed. Um, or uh, we could take two black holes and patch them across this time translation symmetry. In that case, we'll have one of these eternally traversable wormholes. Um, and the, um, when we patch this to four dimensions, we get some, some energy, which uh, essentially is related to the length of the throat, to so how, how, how long the throat is. So in the finite temperature case, we saw that we got this extra energy proportional to Q cubed over, um, well, times T squared over beta squared. Um, and so when we patch it, um, when we take uh, these two solutions, when we take two black holes and we patch it, connect the throats, we'll um, get some energy which is also proportional, but will also involve the length of the throat. So if we want to have a short throat, it will have more energy than if... Uh, it has a longer throat. Um, so we'll have now, so now we assemble this picture, so this is how it looks like. And it's not yet a solution. So, so far we've uh, described a geometry, right? And we'll now, um, um, so the geometry is obtained by taking the two extreme black holes and then connecting them um, the same way that the global ADS2 is connected. Okay. Um, so this is not a solution yet, and but it is not a black hole, so it does, now we don't have a horizon. So it's a geometry without a horizon, uh, because uh, global ADS2 didn't have a horizon, so we'll uh, have no horizon now. That's a global time translation symmetry. Um, uh, so now let's analyze the fermions. So the fermions uh, will be following these magnetic field lines, and so we effectively have a, a, a field moving in one spatial dimension, 
right? So this massless fermion is moving on this circle, okay? So now we have the massless fields on a circle or the CFT, so we can apply the general formula for CFTs that tells us, tell us that the vacuum energy is proportional to one over the length of this circle, okay? So, um, so of course, for each magnetic field line, we have uh, the various circles, um, and the circle has some effective length uh, outside the black hole, and also some effective length uh, inside the black hole. Um, so here you have to be careful about the warp factor and uh, so on. So when I say L is taking all this into account, um, it's not really the proper length, but it's the effective length as it appears in the effective two-dimensional metric that this fermion feels. Um, and so uh, you can, if this distance between these two black holes is short enough, you can ensure that the length, this length is actually longer than this one, right? And so basically the negative energy will be, um, well, minus Q over L. Q is because we have Q of this, uh, this massless fermions. Um, and L is, well, that's the same formula we had uh, for a general 2D CFT. Um, so then in order to find the solution, we basically have to balance the uh, energy of the, um, the energy cost. So because we connected the two black holes, there was some kind of energy cost uh, uh, for that reconnection, some geometric energy curvature, let's say. Uh, and that was uh, Q cubed over L squared. That comes from the classical Einstein action plus these gauge fields. Um, and then we have the Casimir energy. And so now we minimize with respect to L to find the minimum. And we get an L which uh, goes like Q squared. Okay? So, that's, uh, so now, we've, uh, now we have a solution. We determine the length of the throat. Now, um, th this, this might strike you as a very hand-waving argument, but you can uh, go and really solve the, the you, you can find the stress tensor uh, given by this, uh, these fermions and then plug them into the equations and, and get the actual solution. So, uh, but the final answer is the same as what you get through this simple argument. Yes. Uh, the, the two black, uh, two, the yes. two near horizon geometries yes. were, were oppositely charged to yes, start yes, with. Yes, they are oppositely charged. So they would attract. Yes, they would attract. But so far we're just doing the yeah, so far we're doing initial the initial time so slice. This is a solution in the throat region. This is not a solution in the ambient space. So we, we are not there yet. Yeah. Um, so this is not yet a solution. As, as Veronica said, these two objects uh, they would attract and fall, fall to each other. Yeah? Um, so in order to prevent that, we can uh, take those two black holes um, and make them rotate. So we can now make them rotate, and then they will not fall into each other. And so this uh, is a configuration which uh, will live for a while. So uh, now, in order to make it work, you need that this distance uh, well should be... Um, yeah, so um, there are some conditions that this distance have to, has to weigh, and we'll, we'll discuss what those conditions are. So first of all, we said that L uh, was proportional to Q squared. That came from stabilizing the throat, right? Uh, we also said that the distance in the ambient space had to be smaller than L, right? That's uh, to, for this computation of the Casimir energy. And um, so that's some condition on, on, on D. So the black holes have to be... Um, close enough, so you cannot separate them by hugely... Uh, I mean, if, if you try to separate them by a huge amount, then you lose the solution. So you, And that's what forbids the warm host where you can travel faster than light. So, um, so indeed, in D has to be bigger than L, so smaller than L. I mean, this condition is also saying that it's faster to go through the ambient space than it is to go through the wormhole. It's the, the same. This, this, this inequality is the same, uh, same condition. Um, and... Now, when you have these black holes that are rotating, uh, you don't want the rotation to uh, destroy the throat. And it can destroy it in, in various ways. So one, um, one way is that the, well, this, black, this will be emitting some gravity waves of frequency omega, the rotation frequency. And if uh, these gravity waves get into the interior, uh, they, uh, so one, they might destroy the interior. Okay? So if you, if you send too much energy in this wormhole, you'll create a black hole again. So um, there is some energy gap uh, inside the wormhole, which is given by 1 over L. Um, and so you want the rotation frequency to be uh, smaller than 1 over L. Now, th there is another effect that uh, it's another relevant effect, which is that 
because they are rotating, they are accelerating, right? And so the, they will have an unroot temperature. So you cannot make the temperature exactly zero. And naively, you might think that the, the, the temperature is the acceleration. But it actually, for a rotating particle, the unroot temperature is the angular velocity. Um, and so demanding that the unroot temperature is smaller than 1 over L, this energy gap. So you don't want to heat up the, the throat region to, um, to temperatures much higher than the energy gap. So that, again, uh, gives this condition. And this condition uh, is some other uh, condition on the, on the distance. This is just the Kepler's formula for the rotation, the angular rotation velocity. And, um, and then you, um, you get this other condition. Unfortunately, these two conditions are compatible in the sense that there is a d which is bigger than something and smaller than something else. I mean, the crucial thing here is that this exponent is less than 2. Okay. Um, so, I mean, th th this condition is d bigger than something because we want them to rotate slowly enough. So the bigger you make d, the slower they rotate. And so that's why we get an inequality in that direction. Um, now, other effects we could think of are also small. I mean, we can allow a little bit of eccentricity. We can uh, add electromagnetic and gravitational radiation, and things seem to be OK. Um, one thing is, uh, one thing that is, um, OK, so let me say. So here, the final configuration is these two rotating black holes. They look like two extremal black holes if you are far away. Uh, but as you uh, approach them, uh, you will find that if you were to fall into one of these, you would find that, uh, well, you come up back out of the other and you don't fall into a horizon. So you would see you are not in a black hole. Or more precisely, you could scatter a wave, a very low frequency wave from far away, and it would, would not be absorbed as it is in a black hole, but it will just come back out in uh, small time, relatively small time. Um, it has a small binding energy, so it has a little uh, more negative energy than two completely disconnected black holes. Um, Yes. Why doesn't this configuration violate the topological censorship? Uh, because uh, quantum effects ensure that, so the topological censorship theorem is um, based on the integrated null energy condition, that it should be positive. But the Casimir, effect, the Casimir energy here uh, violates that condition. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, okay, so, um, I mean, this, in principle, could exist in nature if you could uh, make this whole, whole setup smaller than the um, smaller than the electroweak scale. So d has to be smaller than the electroweak scale, so that all the fermions can be approximated by being massless, um, and then um, and then you so that gives you some range over which you could have this. So let's say the standard model is valued all the way to a Planck scale. So then you have uh, some range of uh, Qs that are possible. Um, now, the fact that it can exist doesn't mean that it's easily produced. Uh, it doesn't mean it's absolutely stable. This solution is only metastable. Um, and so I, I don't, we don't know how to produce it in a reasonably easy way. I mean, maybe, uh, yeah, maybe some, someone can think of a better way to produce it. Um, so you find these two black holes that are connected through a wormhole. Of course, they are much smaller than the ones that LIGO or even the LHC can detect, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but uh, this, from the outside, you could say that they are a pair of entangled black holes. So they are entangled, and the fact their entanglement somehow uh, removed the horizon. Um, um, now, as I said, the, the, they are um, in, in the above regime, so for the above solution that we discussed, uh, the, the unroot temperature is somehow of the order of uh, the angular frequency. It's not equal to the angular frequency, it's a logarithmic correction, but uh, it's basically of the order of magnitude of the angular frequency. And um, so then uh, at this temperature, we would, the stable phase uh, would be the one where you have two, two black holes, not, uh, not this connected wormhole. So this one is, is metastable, so it's locally fine, but uh, it's not the minimum free energy configuration at this temperature. And I don't know how, how we can steer the system. If you started with two disconnected black holes, how you would uh, steer the system into this configuration. If you could hold the two black holes and so that they don't fall into each other, then by waiting long enough, eventually you will find this configuration. Um, it's the question of how long you have to wait. But uh, if you have all the time in the world, you can wait, and the, the minimum energy configuration would be this one. Um, 
Yes. It has zero entropy because there is no horizon. Yes. Uh, but non-zero entanglement entropy, why is that consistent? Um, well, I mean, you, you, you can, there is no problem in having zero entropy. I mean, to, to a bell pair of two spins has zero entropy, but if you look at only one, it will have a non-zero entanglement entropy, right? I mean, here, here the idea is that if you stay outside and you look at only one of the black holes, you forget about the other one, right? Uh, then that, that will have some, some entanglement entropy. Or if you made this in ADS, you just say that the neck or the wormhole is the RT surface. Yeah. That, that'll that capture the entanglement entropy, but there is no... Yes, yes, that's right, that's right. That would be the RT surface if you just focus on only one black hole, right? If you focus on the whole system, then uh, the, 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 there is no entanglement. Um, also, I guess, let's say, going back to uh, this picture, right? So before in the SYK model, we discussed that we, we had two black holes and we put this interaction between the two, right? So here, what plays the role of the interaction is these fermions that go between the two black holes in the ambient space, right? Um, so that's uh, what plays the role of the interaction. That, it, it, that looked weird from the point of view of, the, of, of ADS2. So if you were only thinking about ADS2, it, you say, well, how am I going to get an interaction between one boundary and the other boundary, right? But that can happen if that whole ADS2 space is embedded in this uh, higher dimensional, four, well, in this four dimensional space in this way, right? Then uh, these two things that look like boundaries are really close in this ambient uh, four dimensional space. Um, and you get this, uh, this situation. Okay, so um, conclusions are that we display this uh, solution of an Einstein Maxwell theory with charged fermions. And it's a traversable wormhole in four dimensions with no exotic matter. So even the fields of the standard model are good enough for this. Uh, and it balances between classical and quantum effects. Um, it has non-trivial space-time topology, which uh, is forbidden in the classical theory, um, uh, but it's allowed in the quantum theory. They, they do not violate causality, so all of this is compatible with causality. Uh, the, it has no horizon and no entropy. And we did not explain how to form it, so we don't explain. Uh, so. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this interaction between the two black holes yeah. Um, so somehow this, uh, you know, in the previous half of yeah. the mm -hmm. talk, the SIL, SIL, SIR yeah. Yeah. is yeah. supposed to mimic that kind of thing. I mean, can, yeah. can one see yeah. this in a little, uh, I mean, more detail how that happens? Um, well, I mean, so when we have a, we have a fermion in the bulk, right? Uh, and then we put some interaction which looks like psi help, psi right, right? What we are doing is we are essentially, uh, it's a bit like connecting a little bit through a weak link, so if the coefficient is small, the two sides, right? Okay. Um, imagine, so one way, in, imagine you fold this up, right, into a cylinder, um, and then you connect a little bit these two ends of the strip, right? That's what's creating the circle. Ah, nice. Um, and how about the rotation? I mean, the, when you add the rotation, how does it... Uh, well, well, the rotation the... doesn't have a picture here. So rotation is a, is a picture, is, is a property of the four-dimensional solution. The idea is that if you are inside the throat, you don't know that you're, the whole thing is rotating. Can it be like some kind of a kaluza klein uh, uh, gauge field coming from the you know, S-wave reduction? Uh, um, I don't think the rotation has any implication in th inside the throat. So um, the, 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 the rotation is uh, how this throat is embedded in four dimensions. So it's embedded uh, in a rotating way, but uh, the throat itself is, is basically the same. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, there are, there are Kaluza Klein gauge fields and so on coming from the sphere, right? There are SU2 uh, gauge fields coming from. Uh, in two dimensions, there are SU2 gauge fields coming from the SU2 rotations of the sphere. Yeah. But they are not, um, they are, I don't think they are playing an important role in the, in the throat region. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. 
So you you described the solution in some in just in a non supersymmetric Einstein Maxwell theory. Yeah. Um, in supersymmetric theories, you do have rotating two two center solutions. Uh -huh. uh, you think it's possible to find to starting with one of those to construct a supersymmetric solution that has precisely these properties? Yeah, I think I think it I, I think I think it should be possible to construct it in some other cases. So um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean in a supersymmetric setup. Um, well, these are two black holes that have opposite charges, right? Um, so one one situation. So, so normally, two black holes in flat space that have opposite charges are not uh, supersymmetric. Um, but if you are, for example, in ADS in ADS space, and so let's say you are in um, ADS three times S two, just for example, um, there you could imagine having a black hole that is at the north pole of the S two and another one at the south pole of the S two, and they can have opposite charges and be BPS. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in a situation like that, perhaps you can uh, construct a solution like this. Um, there probably have to be some extra elements because you, you don't want the energy to be negative because it can't have a, a binding energy. But may, maybe some interaction with the scalars will uh, presumably uh, make sure the energy is not negative. Uh, so, in your original uh, ER equals CPR paper, mm -hmm. uh, you had uh, considered uh, a pair of black holes in the same ambient space, uh, yes, namely yes, the yes, Ernst solution. Yes, yes. And uh, in the ER equals EPR picture, as I understand it, uh, mm -hmm. it's crucial that the wormholes remain uh, untraversable. Yes, yes. And uh, if uh, in this case yes, yes. Uh, you are uh, tuning yeah. some parameters to bring the black hole close and yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. making the wormhole traversable, yes, yes. Uh, does this uh, destroy uh, the uh, ER equal EPR uh, picture? No, no, no. I think uh, it, it's, it's compatible, but the what determines whether the wormhole is traversable or not so is whether you have some interactions between these two systems. So if you have two systems and they interact with each other, then it's fine to, to be traversable. I see. Right? Um, yeah, so. And uh, to come back to my earlier question, uh, how would you interpret uh, this uh, uh, global time isometry and point chi isometry in uh, the ambient space? Um, well, the, the global time isometry is the isometry of the uh, of this whole configuration, right? So this uh, configuration of the two black holes has a global time translation symmetry, and that's uh, the, that that isometry. So we preserved it throughout the space time. Even in the rotating space time, we have an overall time translation symmetry that well, is it's time translation plus uh, rotation, and that that is uh, preserved in this uh, solution. And that in the interior corresponds to the, um, the global time translation in ADS2. Yep. Yep. Uh, I, I was wondering if you have multiple pairs of equally charged, uh, equal opposite charge charges, and maybe all of them relatively close by. Uh, can you have uh, configurations there as well, which in, and in which maybe the wormholes reconnect in different ways uh, uh, between different pairs. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think so. So, for example, I think you could probably take take one of the black holes and split it into two, for example, and then you have two going into one. Uh, that I think is uh, quite possible. Um, but um, yeah, you have the question of whether they will be stable, they will separate, and so on. It, uh, yeah, I mean, there are many things like this that one could ask. Uh, it just depends on how much external things you want to, to, to put in to make sure that they are stable. Uh, I, I mentioned that uh, this rotating, I, I forgot to mention one thing. So this rotating black hole is, um, um, is metastable in four dimensions, four flat dimensions. But if you put the whole thing in ADS, uh, then you can make it rotate. And if the ADS radius is uh, small enough, um, then uh, you will not be emitting gravitational radiation. And in that case, you can consider the system at zero temperature. I mean, you can couple the ADS to some external bath and external zero temperature uh, large system, and then the whole system can radiate and find the minimum. 
so, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so I just wanted to understand uh, this angular momentum and energy, how does it go with the flux? Like if you have Q units of flux, if, if you, how much of binding energy, how does it scale with Q? Do you, have, do you get a solution for every Q and? Uh, yeah, so the, um, well, it, it, it is just the angular momentum of two uh, masses, right, in okay. the Newtonian theory, uh, orbiting at some distance. So the D is, is, is long enough so that you can use the Newtonian approximation. And then... Uh, and the, the mass momentum. goes like flux square? Or? Yeah, so angular momentum is uh, D times, uh, well, the, 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 the mass times uh, the velocity. Um, yeah. And, uh, Wouldn't there be an upper bound on how much Q you can mock up because the black holes would have to be still rotating less than the speed of light? Oh, sorry. The no, no, no. As you, as, you, as you make Q larger, you so, so separate them more. And so at least in the, in the theory I described, there is no upper bound on Q. But then the D would have to get larger. Yeah, the, the D gets larger. So it all scales up. As, as Q becomes larger, uh, everything gets scaled up and uh, you have a solution for any, for any Q. Okay, if there are no further questions, let's thank uh, Juan again.